everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for another session in our 2021 Climate Action Webinar Series here through AIA California. My name is Bill Burke. I'm co-chair with Frank Bostrom of the AIA California's uh, Committee on the Environment Education Subcommittee, and I'll be your moderator for today's segment. So just a few uh, background things before we get going. So as you know, AIA California has developed an in-depth series focused on understanding and implementing the AIA's framework for design excellence. This series will run through the end of this year and will feature monthly hour-long general climate action webinars, as well as 90-minute webinars that dive deeper into technical topics. Additionally, AIA California has partnered with various organizations, such as Woodworks, to bring bonus content to you in the comfort of your own office, wherever that may find you. As always, all webinar content and additional resources will be available on the AIA California website shortly after each session. Uh, a few quick housekeeping reminders before we get started. We do want you to ask questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A uh, window don't put them into the chat window. It really will help us if they all go into the Q&A window. And then I will um, sort of moderate those questions. And uh, one thing I should mention is that if you do see a question, you should be able to like the question so that we can see that there are multiple people interested in that particular question. Uh, okay, so um, in addition to supporting AIA's uh, AI California's climate action initiatives. Woodworks is a proud partner of AI California's 2021 Monterey Design Conference. MDC is coming to you this year, wherever you are. So the virtual format is our way of inviting you to see what makes the Monterey Design Conference the architect's treat and why we have so many loyal attendees. Our headliner speakers this year will join us from Portugal, Japan, England, Boston, and of course, California. So clear your calendar for October 21 and 22 and carve out time to focus on hearing these amazing architects and how their work is shaping the world. Okay, so now on to today's session. Um, today's session qualifies for 1.5 AIA HSW learning units for those of you watching live and AIA California staff will report these units for you. So uh, when you registered, uh, you should have entered your AIA uh, member number. And so AIA staff has that. So if you did that, credits will just get re reported for you. I wanna let you know the session is being recorded and will be posted on the AIA California website with additional resources and a PDF of the presentation shortly after today's session. So, okay. So issues surrounding carbon are in the forefront of many building designers' minds. As a result, questions can arise as to what building products should be specified to help achieve a more sustainable structure. This presentation will introduce innovative wood construction, including mass timber, modular, and prefabricated wood buildings. The benefits of these materials will be highlighted, focusing on their positive environmental impacts. Basic terminology, uh, around carbon will be reviewed along with information on carbon sequestration in wood. U.S. sustainable forestry pro practices will be discussed as well. Um, so we'd just like to quickly uh, and briefly introduce today's presenters. Um, there's much more, uh, they have far more um, background and qualifications than I'm going to mention, but I'll just sort of give a, a couple of highlights. So um, Chelsea Dranick is a licensed structural engineer in the state of California. She received her Bachelor of Science in Engineering from Harvey Mudd College and a Master's in Civil Engineering from Stanford University. Chelsea spent nine years in structural design consulting prior to joining Woodworks. Her experience is in a variety of sectors, including residential, higher education, and retrofit of existing and historic structures. She's passionate about sustainability and the use of wood as a building material to reduce the embodied carbon emissions of structures. Our second speaker is Mike Romanowski. Mike 
received his Bachelor of Science in Architectural Engineering from California Polytechnic State University at San Luis Obispo um, back in 1979. And he has 37 years of structural engineering, design, plan check, peer review, and investigative experience. He's also been involved in the production of engineering calculations and construction documents, construction administration, field investigations, and report writing for educational, commercial, industrial, medical, institutional, residential, and military projects utilizing all types of materials. Mike is a structural engineer in the state of California. So with that, I'm gonna uh, turn my camera off so you will no longer be seeing me and I will turn things over to Chelsea and Mike. Great, thank you so much, Bill. Um, all right, hopefully you can see my screen. Mike, see my screen? I can see your screen and I just wanna say hello to everybody. Um, you'll catch me in the second half here, um, but I'm glad everybody could join us today. Great, thank you. So yeah, as Bill said, I'm Chelsea Drenick, a regional director here at Woodworks, uh, here with my colleague, Mike, and we'll be presenting on wood buildings, innovative products, carbon and forestry. So before jumping into the content of this presentation, I wanna say a few quick words about Woodworks for those who may not know about us. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping project teams design and construct wood buildings. We do a lot of presentations like this. And if you're interested in a lunch and learn for your office, please reach out. We're happy to do that. But our main focus is actually on providing free wood design assistance to architects, engineers, and others in the building industry. Ask us your questions, bring us your challenges. So Woodworks has a team of design professionals located around the country, ready to provide assistance on your projects. We provide one-on-one -on -one assistance based on where you, the designer, is. We do this because we get to know our local jurisdictions, local codes. We can get to know you as well. Uh, I'm located in San Francisco. I'm the regional director for Northern California, Nevada, and Utah. My colleague, Mike, is located in San Diego, and he's the regional director for Southern California, Arizona, and New Mexico. So the dividing line for us is uh, San Luis Obispo actually. So if you're in San Luis Obispo or South, please reach out to Mike. Otherwise you can reach out to me. So the reason we can provide free assistance to you is because of our funders. So thank you to our funders, the Softwood Lumber Board, the US Department of Agriculture and Forestry Innovation Investment. We also have a number of funders who are manufacturers and we get to talk to them a lot, hear about their products, uh, learn about what they do. Uh, so we can help um, provide information on their products to you, uh, provide their contact information to you, let us know. We also have a new Woodworks manufacturer and supplier directory on our website. So you can filter our partners by uh, their products uh, and find their contact that information that way as well. All right, so because one of the things we're talking about today is mass timber, I wanted to share with you the Woodworks Innovation Network. Our project assistance is confidential, but we wanted to sh some, have something that would allow folks to showcase their projects and connect with other experienced professionals. So we've also been tracking mass timber projects we know about in design and construction, which is at over a thousand since we started tracking in 2013. In 2015, we are assisting on a handful of mass timber projects in 2020 alone, there were over 250 projects that we helped out on. So this exponential growth in mass timber is very exciting and mass timber is really here to stay. We have a number of national events as well. We have a monthly free webinar. Uh, the next one is mixed use or mixed occupancy buildings designed for density with confidence. Uh, we also have partnered with Hanson Wade for an actual in-person advancing mass timber construction conference coming up in October. Uh, and if you want to find out more about our upcoming events, please visit our website at woodworks.org. We also have a number of resources, design resources, case studies uh, available to download on our website. This is a recent one, uh, case study of 1430Q in Sacramento. It's actually a six over two project. So this goes through the AMMR process, how uh, the product team was able to justify six stories of light frame over two story podium. Uh, so as Bill said, this is AIA accredited. If you pro provided your uh, AIA number, you will receive credit. 
uh, and he read through our course description and our learning objectives as well. All right, so here's our outline uh, of our presentation today. So I'll briefly introduce innovative wood products, including mass timber. We'll go over the benefits of innovative products and why we're seeing mass timber gain popularity. And then I'll review carbon basics and how material choice is related to sustainability and understand carbon storage in wood products. Then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mike, who will review sustainable forestry practices in North America, and then talk about what's next with mass timber, looking at the new tall wood code provisions that were adopted here in California at the beginning of July. All right, so mass timber construction. I like to think of the delineation between mass timber and heavy timber, where heavy timber is a historic style of construction. We're thinking of a solid wood member, a solid eight by eight single piece of wood for a column, 10 by 14 solid wood beam. Mass timber can have these same sizes, but it's made up of a number of smaller individual wood members that are laminated together, either using adhesives, nails, screws, or another type of mechanical fastening. So here's a visual comparison that I like a lot. Heavy timber on the left, mass timber on the right. One of the old adages with heavy timber was large column, large tree, meaning that every single large cross section of wood had to come from a single tree, which can be hard to source. So if you have to have that 12 by 12 column, you have to have a tree that's large enough to find that. Whereas on the right, we can still have that 12 by 12 column, but instead of coming from a singular log, we can fabricate it from many smaller pieces. So we can use commodity lumber products, perhaps even lower grade products using smaller diameter trees to still produce these similar size elements, columns, beams, and panels. So let's look at a few common mass timber products here. Uh, on the left, we have glue laminated timber, uh, also referred to as glue lamb, uh, typically makes up beams and columns in a mass timber building. Glue lamb has been around for a hundred years now. Uh, common in light frame construction as well. Uh, you know, if you need a long span uh, in a house, you can use glue lamb instead of a steel beam. Uh, you can hide it in a wall, typically in an industrial grade, or it can be exposed, and then you're using more of an architectural grade. CLT, cross laminated timber, shown with solid sawn laminations here in the center, and structural composite laminations on the right. I think CLT uh, is almost used interchangeably with mass timber now when we say a CLT building, um, but it's actually a particular product. So we're taking two buys typically, we're laying them down, a screen of adhesive, and then the next layer is cross, so 90 degrees rotated, and so on and so forth until you get to all your laminations. So typical thicknesses here, we have three ply, five ply, seven ply, um, and the size of these panels are eight to 12 feet wide, uh, 40 to 60 feet long. So these are some really big panels here. On the right, I mentioned this is structural composite lumber laminations. Uh, this is a product from Ferris Lumber. Uh, they're calling it mass plywood panel. So it's basically layers of plywood glued together to make a much larger panel. Other products that are less known, but also available. Uh, we have dowel laminated timber, DLT, nail laminated timber, NLT, and glue laminated timber, GLT. So in all three of these products, all the laminations are running in the same direction. So we have a single span product here compared to cross lamination where it was two way span. Uh, these are attached, these laminations are attached differently. Uh, dowel laminated timber, we have hardwood dowels that are driven through the laminations. There's no adhesives, there's no other mechanical fastening, just this hardwood dowel. In the center nail laminated timber, we have nails attaching one lamination to each other. Uh, and then on the right, it's basically a glue lamb beam on the side. Uh, one thing to note with these products, because the laminations are running in one direction, we need to have expansion joints between them during construction, as you can see here in this photo. Uh, and that's because the shrinking and swelling is all in the same direction. Uh, and then once the building is enclosed, you can uh, close up those joints. Uh, but this is different than CLT, uh, which is very dimensionally stable. So what are our mass timber building options? There's a lot of different options, actually. Um, I think post and beam on the left here is most common or commonly known. Uh, it's common for office buildings. The posts and beams are typically glue lamb, but they could be solid sawn. They could be another type of engineered wood product. Um, flat plate uh, option shown in the center using CLT as a two-way span system, similar to flat plate concrete construction. 
Note looking down this photo, we don't see any beams, only CLT and posts. Uh, also note though that there's a tighter grid spacing. So uh, I think this grid spacing shown here is nine feet by 13 feet. So it's much more common we've seen for residential projects, uh, whereas the post and beams were common for office buildings. And this photo in the center of the flat plate is uh, Brock Commons, a student housing project in uh, Canada. On the right, we have honeycomb style uh, or house of cards style much more common in Europe, where both the vertical bearing system and horizontal decks are all mass timber. One thing to note though, is we don't have to do an entire mass timber building uh, out of mass timber. For multifamily, we've seen CLT floors with these prefab panelized light frame walls used very successfully. We're basically replacing the floor joists that would typically be there with CLT panels that are spanning to these wood bearing walls. We've also seen a lot of steel hybrid. Maybe this is the best fit for your project. Uh, finding it best to, to combine steel with the CLT deck. Uh, we've been seeing this a lot on office projects. So Mike will be discussing the new tall wood code provisions uh, that allow up to 18 stories of mass timber later on in the presentation. Prior to these provisions, uh, building codes in the US limited wood frame structures, either light frame or heavy and mass timber to five to six stories maximum. Um, but we can do quite a bit with this, actually. I think a lot of folks think of type five when they think of light frame, which limits you to four stories. So we can do type three construction, type four construction, and we can go up to five stories for residential, six stories for business. And with this, we can add mezzanines as shown here uh, with the mezzanine provisions. We can put on a podium. We can get pretty tall and pretty big buildings with light frame. And here are a couple examples of projects that have used these code provisions. On the left, we have a project in LA, a five over one podium. And on the right, we have a five over two in Seattle. It's becoming typical to see these heights, particularly in urban settings where you wanna maximize that square footage on the property. So mass timber is an innovative wood product that's creating a lot of buzz, but I wanted to introduce some other innovations we're seeing as well before getting into our sustainability content. This first one is panelization of walls with offsite construction. We see various levels of panelization from project to project, from just the studs and top and bottom plates to what you see here, where it's not just, not just the studs, not just the wood, but a panel with waterproofing, some of the cladding systems starting to be installed, really maximizing what can be installed offsite so you can minimize what's done on site, minimizing waste as well. And here we're taking it to the next level with volumetric modular construction, like you see here, where you're building 80% of the building offsite then installing these boxes. We're seeing this more and more, doing as much as possible offsite to minimize that time on site. Also minimizing RFIs. So it's a, it's a really great thing that's happening and exciting to explore. All right, so that's the innovative wood we are seeing in the industry right now. A lot of focus has been on mass timber, but I wanted to mention these prefabrication innovations of light frame construction, because there's a lot of overlap in what we see as the benefits between the two. So let's talk about that. In 2019, we are at a global population of 7.7 .7 billion people. This is expected to rise around 10 billion people in 2050. Where do we house everyone? Where will they work? How will climate change impact where people can live and work? So we need more buildings, we need more housing, but buildings generate nearly 40% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions. That's what's shown here, the yellow pieces of the pie. 28% is building operations, 11% is embodied carbon emissions. And that's when a building is built, how much CO2 is released due to its materials and construction. So looking at this embodied carbon and operational carbon more closely, Operational carbon is a bigger portion of building emissions, 75% here. But embodied carbon is an upfront cost. So it takes 17 years for this building that we're looking at here for operational carbons to surpass embodied carbons. So we can have a real impact by reducing those embodied carbons in the short term. And these, these percentages do vary building to building. Uh, this example here is a traditional non-wood building. I think the industry, the construction building industry has focused a lot on operational carbons, which is great. We need to reduce those. But now we're looking at this embodied carbon more and more. How can we reduce it? 
operational energy emissions are improving, you know, greener grids, more efficient heating and cooling. Embodied energy is not insignificant and it doesn't have to be a necessary evil of building a new building. So one thing that can help with that is wood. Wood is 49% carbon by mass or weight. In other words, approximately 50% of this wood is carbon, carbon that was in our atmosphere contributing to global warming and is now physically converted into solid form of wood and put into a building. Whole building life cycle assessments typically show wood buildings as a way to reduce the embodied carbon footprint of a building. And this is what I'll be diving deeper into in just a moment. Carbon basics, how material choice is related to sustainability and understanding carbon storage in wood products. So just one moment and we'll get deeper into this, but I wanna talk about the why, why are we seeing more of these innovative wood products a little more? So another why, particularly for mass timber is biophilia. Biophilia is the innate human instinct to connect with nature. We feel good around nature. We feel good around wood. Studies have shown this. And this is more applicable, as I said, to mass timber than other types, you know, where we're hiding the wood in the walls. Although, you know, we can mimic this look with wood finishes uh, to get the same effect. You know, thinking about it, looking at these living rooms, which one would you like in your house? Another driving factor for change, this why of these innovative wood products is the labor shortage. It's existed for many years. A lot of it was driven by the recession in 08 and 09, and it never really recovered from that. Coupled with urban settings, labor tends to be very expensive and hard to come by in urban settings. Innovative wood products is a way to integrate offsite construction. Then the crew onsite can be smaller and we're creating more jobs offsite and, and it's a more safe work environment. And this point's tied to the previous, uh, compressing construction schedules will re require less time of folks on site. Time is money. Mass timber and prefabrication helps with this. It requires a lot of coordination up front but then when it gets to site, it's like a set of Legos or a piece of Ikea furniture, it goes up very quickly. Uh, this is a project in Seattle. Uh, they did a feasibility study, compare a concrete construction schedule to a mass timber construction schedule. Uh, for the same project, it was a 12 story uh, building and they determined there was a five month saving on the construction schedule to use mass timber. Developers like to hear this, they can see return on their investment that much faster. Rock Commons, I mentioned this earlier, it's an 18 story mass timber student resident hall that's in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, traditional methods would have had 100 people on site. They had 20, 30. And if you would have built it with concrete, you would have had seven to 10 day floor cycle plus a month of temporary shoring and curing. They were doing three days per floor, no shoring, no curing here. Another cool thing about this project is they had a panelized facade that was following the floor so they could quickly seal the building from weather. Another benefit of mass timber, uh, wood in general, is its lightweightness compared to steel and particularly concrete buildings. This is definitely a benefit in an area where there are poor soils, where we're having to install piles at the foundation level. Uh, this is also a benefit here in California for seismic loading. Lighter weight means more efficient seismic systems. Lighter weight also means smaller cranes, lighter tools on site, lots of benefits. So we have uh, some great mass timber design and construction optimi optimization checklists on our website, if you go to woodworks.org. Uh, and this potential benefits table is in that checklist on page three. Uh, this applies to why an owner or developer would want to build a mass timber building. Uh, and a lot of it applies to prefabrication as well. Uh, great to go over with clients. You know, we're not here to say mass timber uh, prefabrication is right for every project, but if some of these benefits ring true, it's worth exploring. Uh, and so I went through a lot of these, you know, fast construction, shorter schedules, it's prefabricated and precise, uh, exposed wood. Uh, if you have that on a project, you get the aesthetic value. Uh, we've seen faster leasing and leasing premiums on mass timber buildings. Uh, and we have that in our business case study. Lightweight structure, especially beneficial on sites with poor soils, uh, labor shortage solutions, um, smaller crews on site, integrating offsite construction. Uh, just in time delivery and small staging. This is great for uh, urban infill projects. You know, if you don't have a big staging area, you can have an offsite staging area and, and bring things to the site in a, on a truck and lift them directly into place. We've seen that a lot. Uh, natural renewable material. I'll talk more, more about that starting on the next slide. Uh, and supporting healthy forests and rural economies, which Mike will be talking about at the end of this presentation. All right, so let's dive into the weeds on wood sustainability and carbon storage. 
So first, looking at US climate policy. For years, states and local entities have been addressing climate change in the absence of federal action. One of our statewide laws here in California is the Buy Clean, which is one of the first laws in the US that specifically targets embodied carbon in construction materials. It sets global warming potential limits on structural steel, carbon steel, reinforcement bars, flat glass, and insulation. Buy Clean California applies to state agencies, uh, California DGS, which is state infrastructure and construction projects, and also the UC and Cal state systems. Uh, because climate reflects an effective national and international response, the Biden administration has begun work on tackling some of these issues, including rejoining the Paris Agreement. Additionally, since the beginning of his administration, Biden has signed a number of executive orders and memorandums to take federal action on climate change. In April, he set a goal to reduce U.S. greenhouse gas emissions to 50% of two, 2005 levels by 2030. All right, so greenhouse gases, what do we mean by this? Greenhouse gases warm the earth by absorbing energy and slowing the rate at which the energy escapes to space. They act like a blanket insulating the earth, like a greenhouse. Greenhouse gas emissions from human activities are the most significant driver of observed climate change since the mid 20th century. Different greenhouse gases have different effects on the earth's warming. And this is based on their ability to absorb energy, which is their radioactive energy, uh, and how long they stay in the atmosphere, known as their lifetime. The concept of global warming potential, also referred to as GWP, was developed to allow comparisons of different gases and their effect on global warming, allowing for more apples to apples comparison. So CO2, by definition, has a global warming potential of one because it's the control, the gas being used as the reference. CO2 remains in the atmosphere for a very long time on the order of thousands of years. Methane is estimated to have a global warming potential of 28 to 36. This means that methane is 28 to 36 times worse than CO2. Methane emitted today lasts about a decade on average, which is much less time than CO2, but it absorbs much more energy. So that net effect of shorter lifetime but higher energy absorption is reflected in the GWP. Nitrous oxide, next on the list, uh, even worse, GWP of 265 to 298. Fluorinated gases are sometimes called high GWP gases because for a given amount of mass, they trap substantially more heat than CO2. So these can remain uh, in the atmosphere as well, uh, you know, tens, thousands or tens of thousands of years. Because CO2 is the baseline reference for other global greenhouse gas, global, sorry, greenhouse gases, it's common practice to express other gases, GWP, in terms of CO2. So these are CO2 equivalents. That's so, so here, when we're talking about this, we're always talking about CO2, but that's not the only gas that's causing greenhouse gas emissions. All right, so getting deeper in the weeds here, going back to chemistry class a little bit, because discussions around climate issues commonly focus on CO2 or CO2 equivalents, carbon and CO2 are sometimes used interchangeably. However, they're not the same. Uh, the molecular mass or molecular weight of carbon is 12 and oxygen is 16. So carbon dioxide has a molecular weight of 44. So we can see one ton of carbon is not the same thing as one ton of CO2 or CO2 equivalents. Rather, one ton of carbon converts to 3.67 tons of CO2. So when we talk about tons of carbons and tons of CO2, it's important to be aware which term you're using. Uh, particularly if you're doing specific calculations. Uh, so when I said earlier, what is 50% carbon by weight, that's carbon, not CO2. So I introduced this idea earlier, embodied carbon and operational carbon. Uh, let's define these terms a little more closely. Uh, embodied carbon is a shorthand way to refer to all the lifetime greenhouse gas emissions due to a building uh, other than for building operation. So most embodied emissions are upstream of building occupancy, uh, pr primarily related to manufacturing of materials. Embodied carbon is different than operational, which is the carbon emissions from producing the energy used to operate a building like powering, heating, and cooling it. So we're focusing here with this presentation on embodied carbon and how wood can help. Uh, so as shown on the last slide, embodied carbon are carbon emission due to um, 
all the things noted here in the figure. So it's from the extraction of the raw materials, uh, transport to the factory, manufacturing, transport to the site, and then construction. Uh, and then if we're looking cradle to grave, uh, which is to the tear down and recycling of a structure, then it includes also things after operation of the structure. So that's the demolishing of the building, hauling away, landfill or recycle. So both sides of operation uh, are the embodied carbon of the structure. Okay, now some more terminology here. Difference between two more terms that are often used interchangeably, uh, but mean slightly different things, which is embodied energy and embodied carbon. They are similar yet distinct metrics to evaluate the environmental impact of a material product or building. So embodied energy is the amount of energy consumed to produce a building, building product, material. This includes energy needed to mine or harvest uh, the natural resources, raw materials, what we were just looking at on the last slide. Embodied carbon here on the right side of the slide is reflects the source of that energy. So the source of that embodied energy. So that could be combustion of fuels, but if you can also use a renewable resource to generate that energy, you have a lower embodied carbon footprint. So an ideal building material is one that has low embodied energy, so it doesn't take a lot of energy to produce, one that has low embodied carbon, so that what energy it does take to produce can primarily be sourced from a renewable resource. All right, so let's dive into Wood's role in this now, starting with looking at the forest carbon cycle. I really like this image from USDA, and the USDA has a number of great graphics to explain forestry and carbon on their website. So life cycle of wood begins with the growth of trees in a forest. So carbon flows into the forest ecosystem as the trees grow, as they absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. Carbon is then stored in a tree for the life of that tree. Left to natural processes, that tree will die and decay, releasing carbon back into the atmosphere. So that's what we're seeing here in this carbon cycle, this inner loop. Instead, carbon can continue to be stored by using that solid material in buildings and building products. So throughout the life of a wood building, it's storing basically acting as a carbon sink, storing that carbon dioxide as carbon in the wood. So that's this outer loop that we see here. However, one thing to note, it's only sustainable here if a forest is sustainable, if the forest remains a forest after the tree was harvested. Uh, Mike's gonna talk about this, but in North America, the forest has remained very stable over the last hundred years. All right, so two more terms here uh, to define sequestration and storage. So carbon sequestration is the process by which CO2 is removed from the atmosphere into positive solid or liquid form in oceans, living organisms, trees, or land. Uh, carbon storage is carbon is stored as a solid in the form of plant material, roots, trunks, branches, stems, leaves. Um, and it continues, can continue to be stored in wood building materials. So we're saying trees sequester carbon during their growth. You know, it's a continuous thing as they grow. Then when we harvest the trees for wood products, that carbon is stored then, keeping it out of the atmosphere for the lifetime of the building and possibly longer if the wood product is reused. So this is a summary slide of long-term positive climate effects of wood and wood products. Uh, it looks at the energy effect, uh, that's the columns here, the carbon effect, as well as additional benefits. Wood is a low energy, low carbon material with a number of added benefits. Some of these added benefits include strengthening rural economies, providing biophilic environments and more. I don't wanna go through all of these on the slide, um, but if you'd like to look at this more in depth, these slides are available on the AIA California website. Uh, and the source of it from uh, Dovetail Partners down at the bottom is also a great source if you're looking to read more. So I looked at the forest carbon cycle earlier. Uh, this uh, image here is focusing on the life cycle of a wood product. Uh, and it starts with what I was talking about before, uh, sequestration of atmospheric CO2 during tree growth. Then we harvest the trees sustainably, uh, which Michael discussed. Then we manufacture wood products, either direct lumber uh, as shown here or engineered wood product, another path. These products then go into our buildings, our housing. 
Once a building is dismantled, the wood can be directly reused or processed and put back into the manufacturing cycle. This is a circular process, reusing and recycle. So this beautiful drawing here is by Gray Organchi Architecture, shows the impact of material extraction on our below grade surface layers and the associated carbon footprint in tons of CO2 per ton of material. So each material shown here uh, has a column uh, and the drawing shows how far we have to dig in order to extract materials in the lithosphere. And above the grade in average is the average carbon footprint of that specific material. So on the left, as we see uh, the roots rooted in the shallow soils of the earth, as we move right, we start digging deep into the lithosphere for stone, aggregate, cements, as we move further right. In the metals, carbon, in the metals column, um, there's various uh, levels of emissions based on the type of metal. Uh, so seeing this, we can see that when it comes to constructing our buildings, what is the only naturally regenerative material option for our structural systems? All right, so let's talk about the specifics of that carbon storage in wood products. So this slide summarizes where carbon is stored in wood, uh, the harvested wood products and forest pools. So harvested wood products uh, at the top here are all wood products in use. This is where wood products for buildings come from or come in. Uh, these products store carbon in the building. And this is what we're focusing on really. Solid waste disposal sites is all wood products that are currently in landfills. Uh, forest pools uh, that include above ground biomass, which is all living biomass above the soil, which is your stems, uh, your stumps, branches, bark, seeds, foliage. Below ground biomass is all living biomass of tree roots. Uh, deadwood uh, is all non-living woody biomass. So whether standing a fallen tree in the so soil, um, that's our deadwood. Litter or forest floor, uh, by litter, we're referring to leaves that have fallen uh, or decaying organic matter on the forest floor. Soil organic carbon is all organic materials in the soil, excluding the roots. So the EPA inventory of US greenhouse gas emissions and sinks shows that in 2019, 1,521 million metric tons of carbon, not CO2, carbon, uh, was being stored in harvested wood products in use. This may sound like a big number, but you can see this is only a very small fraction of all carbon stored across these uh, forest and harvested wood product pools uh, that were discussed in the previous slide. So we can see here, this is the harvested wood in use, um, and then this is the one that is in landfills. So it's very small portion of all the carbon being stored, even though it's a very large number. So this is the backup data, and um, I don't want to, we're not going to read all the numbers here. Um, I think the interesting things about this chart is that you can see here that 1,521, that these products in use, more and more carbon is being stored in wood products across the years. But we can also see here that the forest area is very stable and the forest ecosystem is stable and growing. So uh, this will be discussed further by Mike, um, but this increase in all uh, is great to see. So let's briefly look at the difference between different wood products. So solid sawn wood products have the lowest level of embodied energy. Wood products requiring more processing steps, so plywood, engineered wood products, CLT, flake-based products, um, require more energy to produce, but still require significantly less energy than their non-wood counterparts. And another consideration not discussed here, but I'd like to leave with you as food for thought is construction waste. You know, the innovative wood products I discussed earlier are prefabricated offsite, mass timber, panelized wood, modular, and assembled on site, leaving a very little waste and have very clean construction sites. All right, so we have a few slides here on tools to evaluate carbon impact. So the most robust way of quantifying a building's environmental impact or to compare it to a building of a different material is through a whole building life cycle analysis. 
Life cycle analyses compile and evaluate the inputs, outputs, potential impacts of a product throughout its life. Whole building refers to the fact that we're looking at everything, every building component from the structural system to the mechanical systems, cladding, finishes, foundations. There are a number of tools, LCA tools available, uh, and we're not getting into them here, although we are developing more content around that. So we should have uh, more information on that soon. Uh, what's important to note here is that especially the whole building LCA tools can be very complex and use different methodologies to make comparisons between different materials. As such, it's really important to understand the extents and limitations of each tool before attempting to make comparisons between the results. We also, uh, we have a few links listed here, uh, which are helpful for understanding calculating uh, LCAs. But we also recently released an LCA case study on Plat 15, which is a mass timber building in Denver. Uh, this has not been posted to our website yet, I don't think, uh, but we do have it in PDF form. So it's really thorough uh, document on how they did the LCA on this mass timber building. So if you're interested in that, um, please reach out. Uh, we can send you the PDF um, and it should be posted very soon to the Thinkwood website, I believe. I also wanted to mention that uh, I'm on the SE 2050 committee. Uh, SE 2050 stands for Structural Engineers 2050 Commitment Program. The commitment program is in response to the SE 2050 challenge, which states all structural engineers shall understand, reduce, and ultimately eliminate net embodied carbon in their projects by 2050. Uh, so there's a lot of work being done by structural engineers to understand embodied carbon of structure and how we can reduce it. Uh, we have a lot of resources, uh, links to other LCA case studies, and more information at se2050.org. So a much more simplified calculator uh, is available on the Woodworks website, uh, the Woodworks Carbon Calculator, and we also have a Woodworks Carbon Estimator, which is even more simplified. Uh, so it's important to understand that this is not a replacement for a whole building life cycle assessment. However, it may be helpful in quantifying for yourself or interested parties the benefits of using wood as a structural material. It's a free tool available on our website uh, and the calculator estimates the total wood mass in a building and the associated carbon impacts. Carbon impacts refer to both the amount of carbon stored in the wood building material and the amount of greenhouse gas emissions avoided by choosing wood instead of another more greenhouse gas intensive non-wood material. So the outputs are shown here in this image on the right. Um, it tells you how much volume of wood is used and the type of building you have selected for the square footage. Um, it also shows you uh, how quickly the US and Canadian forests grow this much wood. Uh, so it, it shows you the vast amount of forest we have um, and how quickly it regenerates. Uh, it'll show you the carbon stored in the wood. Um, and also it will say the avoided greenhouse gas emissions uh, compared to using another type of building material. And so then it adds those together for the total potential carbon benefit. Uh, and then it equates that, you know, since it's hard to understand metric tons and what that means, it tells you equivalency to a uh, number of cars that we're keeping off the road with that much uh, carbon benefit or how many uh, years you could operate energy in a home. These graphics uh, shown here from New England's Forestry Foundation summarize the journey from the forest to city. They created the Forest to City Climate Challenge with an ultimate goal to help solve the climate crisis and meet other societal goals by linking mass timber buildings in New England with local forests that sustainably generate the wood for them. So these image are, images are grow on the left. We need innovative solutions to mitigate climate change. We can grow building materials in our regional forests build in the center, we can build our buildings with wood products, a natural renewable resource that stores carbon. And right, we can live, we can build our communities and cities with timber and create a place for people to live that connects them back to our natural forest lands. And with mass timber, we can build tall wood buildings in our urban centers. All right, so thank you for that. Um, at this point, I'm going to give it over to Mike to continue the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. And let's get mine started up here. 
And, and Mike, this is Bill. I just thought I should mention to the folks typing in their questions that we're holding questions to the end. So we will make an effort to get to your questions. We're not uh, ignoring them. So please do continue to put in your questions and, and Chelsea and Mike will get to them at the end of the presentation. Good point. Good point. Thank you. Uh, and I take it you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So thank you very much, Chelsea. Uh, we're going to... Actually, am I on the wrong... I might be on the wrong slide. You know what? <laughs> uh, let me just... I should have started it on my slide. I apologize. I had it all set to start on my slide and I hit the wrong one there. So uh thought this was going to be flawless, but <laughs> just bear with me. Okay. There we go. So I am going to cover from this point forward. Uh, we'll talk about some forestry issues. And then we'll wrap up by talking about what's coming in the new code for mass timber in these uh, taller wood buildings here. So, you know, there's, a, I would say the architectural and engineering profession is certainly much more up to speed on this than the general public, but particularly the general public. There's still a lot of misconceptions out there and people, you know, are worried about oh, we're using all this timber and isn't that depleting our forests? And so one of the questions that's you know, not understood by the general public and, and many other people uh, is, is North America running out of forests? Does specifying wood products contribute to deforestation? And we'll talk about that term in just a minute. And is wood a renewable resource? Well, here at Woodworks, obviously, it's pretty clear what the answer is, and most of you know that, um, but it's not clear to everyone else. And so one of the first things I want to start with is uh, let's talk about the forest area of uh, the United States right now. And when I say forest area, I'm going to talk about volume in just a minute. But basically, from back in about 1630, when the European... Uh, Europeans came over here and started colonizing the country. A lot of deforestation was going on. Forests were being uh, eliminated in favor of building cities, in favor of uh, agriculture, being able to farm the land. And so that kind of went on as the westward expansion happened. But pretty much by the early, what would it be, the 20th century, 1900, the area of forest land had stabilized. And obviously they didn't measure this back in 1630. This is their best scientific estimates, but they did start measuring it in about in the early 1900s. And as you can see from looking at this chart, the area of forest land across the United States for all intents and purposes has not changed for over a hundred years. It was 759 million acres back in 1907. 2012, it's 766 million. So almost exactly the same here, not much change. Now, <clears throat> and, and there's a good line that kind of shows that, not much variation there. So it really has been stable for the past hundred years. Um, and, and I should also mention that uh, our Canadian counterparts to the North, you can see from where we are, and I'll go back there for just a second, where we were in the United States, eh, maybe a 25% reduction uh, to where we're stable now. In Canada, from the time they first started being colonized, they are still at about 91% of their original amount of forest. And they are very similar. It's been very stable for a long time now. So uh, Canada is even uh, better shape than us, although we're really in great shape. Uh, this is a little graphic then that talks about our volume of uh, timber on uh, US timberland. And I will mention that when I say timberland, this does not include uh, uh, national parks and stuff where we're not harvesting wood. So these are the forests where wood harvesting is going on, but you can see now the volume has grown and the uh, green is actually the, uh, that, that's us in the West here. Um, but you can see that volume has been growing pretty consistently. Um, it's a 60% growth since, since 1953 here. 
Um, and, and so that's a real positive in some aspects, but from the standpoint of making forest fires worse, it's actually kind of a bad thing. Because what this part of this means is we haven't been letting Mother Nature do what she would really like to do, which was have natural fires that do thin the forest land. You can think about it back in the 1700s and 1800s, we didn't have aerial tankers to fight fires in the forest. We pretty much couldn't do anything. We just let them burn out. But now we do have that technology. We try to protect every single building that's out there. And unfortunately, the negative effect of that is we're getting much heavier undergrowth. So the, the total volume of timber is increasing. And that is a good thing if you're looking for volume of timber. But in terms of fuel for a fire, it can almost be viewed as a bad thing, too. And so I'll get to, at the end of my presentation, I'll talk about why mass timber is really going to be helping to solve this problem here. Um, here's a little chart we have that basically talks about um, forest land ownership. And <clears throat> what this chart is talking about is the dark green is showing all public forests and the light green is showing all private forests. And then white is non-forest, uh, gray is the urban areas. And you can see there's quite a bit of private forest uh, back east less total amount of forest, but more public forest in the West here. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So the way this breaks down is 44% uh, of that then is publicly owned, but the remaining 56% is privately owned. And within that sector of 56% private ownership, 42% of that is family owned. The other 14% is uh, basically corporations, partnerships, and tribes. Um, but believe it or not, it, of that 42% of family, oh, most of that is individuals and family. And, and it's, it's something in the neighborhood of like 10 million different families and, and individuals. So a lot of them have very small parcels, um, but, but that's, you can see, that's really a high majority of these forests. And so obviously, Pretty, seems pretty intuitive, but the economic value of forest products is the motivation for private landowners to keep the land forested. And so if, if there wasn't a demand, like you hear people say, we shouldn't harvest any more trees. Well, okay, then all those people, they own those forests, what are they gonna do? They're gonna find another use for it. They're gonna plow it under, sell it off or develop whatever, but as long as there's a demand for forest products, that's going to ensure the health of our forests. And people oftentimes forget that it's actually a good thing to be harvesting our forests. Um, not everybody understands that, but here's kind of a breakdown then um, by how much has been harvested in the private and public sectors. And public sectors was actually kind of on the increase until about 1976. And they passed something called the National Forest Management Act of 1976. And that's when basically the feds came down and said, we need to have a lot more stricter regulations. And we're really going to cut back on the amount of uh, harvesting of public forests. So the vast majority these days now uh, of all the lumber we harvest is from the private forest, not from these public forests here. Um, and so I, I used this term before, but there's this term called deforestation and regeneration. You need to understand the definition of refor or deforestation is the permanent conversion of forest land to non-forest land use. So this is what's going on, for instance, in the uh, you know, Africa, Brazil, the, the rainforest where they just burn them down, bulldoze them down, change it to some other use. When the, when the forest doesn't come back, that's deforestation. Worldwide agricultural expansion is one of the biggest uh, reasons for this. And as we know, our population is expanding and worldwide they're struggling to grow more food. So that's where a lot of it happens. But in the US, we are so tightly controlled here Basically, the, reef, the rate of deforestation has been virtually zero for decades. And, and so that's something to remember. Um, we practice good forestry. Uh, and, and as long as we do that, we are not, even though we're harvesting, and, and I mean, even clear-cut harvesting, 
There's a reason for clear cut harvesting. For certain species, it's the only way you can get them to regrow. That is not deforestation because we are replacing the forest. So important to remember, you hear the term deforestation, but in the US and all of North America, Canada as well, it is really not a problem whatsoever. Um, so let's dig a little bit into this forest management thing. Um, they are more than timber factories. There are, and, and this is something I wanna get across. You do need to think about a forest as one of the uses is just like a farmer who owns a plot of land and he plants corn. He harvests it every year and sells his product, but he doesn't wanna do anything that's gonna harm the soil or the water around there or whatever. He wants to be able to grow it and harvest it again next year. People with private forests do the same thing. Their harvest cycle is just more on a 30 to 40 year cycle rather than every year. And so here's a number of tools that can be used um, that are at our disposal. And so obviously we wanna balance the long and short-term desires for the multiple uses. So not just for the product itself, but to be able to get out and hike in pristine forests, to ride our recreational vehicles in the pristine forest, to you know, see all this great stuff without harvesting. So harvesting is a part of it, but preserving a, a part of it is too. And so among those tools, best management practices, there's a lot of state, federal, and provincial monitoring of forest inventory programs, obviously uh, practices and laws. We require all of our uh, loggers to get trained and certified. Uh, and so this is all part of these sustainable forage man management uh, practices. Um, this is a great quote from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Basically, forestry is the art, of science, art and science of creating, using, and conserving forests. Forestry profession was a pioneer in developing techniques for sustainable management and later techniques for the multiple use of forests. The term sustainable forest, forest management is synonymous with good forestry. So we've had good, basically since the start of the 19th century where the practice of forestry came into vogue, we have been practicing good forestry and good forestry is sustainable forestry. Um, we, we probably have the best managed forests in the entire world here in North America here. So I, I alluded to this before, but his, here's that National Forage Forest Management Act of 1976. It was very, uh, lots of new regulations and stuff. And this is where basically the Fed said, okay, we're gonna back off on the amount we harvest and we're gonna tightly control everything. The interesting thing I wanna mention here, um, and we'll talk about it a little later when we talk about forest certification, because the Feds have introduced this act and they feel they do a really good job of controlling these forests, you will not be able to find ever any certified forest like FSC or one of those certifications on federal lands. They don't believe it's necessary because they know they are practicing good forestry. There's no need for them to do it. It's just an extra cost for them. So all certified forests are coming from, uh, certified wood is coming from private land. So again, here's a little graphic here showing our national forest. Um, you can see most of them are back in the, in the west, northwest here, uh, very few but out in the east there. U.S. Forest Service then manages about 188 million acres of national forest. Uh, first one was Yellowstone. 40 states have at least one national forest. The biggest, which wasn't even on that map, is in Alaska, but also California. Idaho, Oregon, and Colorado. That should be no surprise, we all live out this way. Um, the, this Forest Management Act, the language in there, basically requires comprehensive land management for all US national forests. And the goals are to sustain the multiple uses of its renewable resources in perpetuity while maintaining the long-term health and productivity of the land. And so these plans are required to address a number of things such as best available scientific information, public participation, social, economic, ecological sustainability, and ecological diversity. Now I talked about these uh, sustainable forestry management systems. Here are the four most commonly uh, heard of ones in North America here. 
And again, there are more than four, but these are the most common. So FSD, FSC stands for Forest Stewardship Council. This is probably the most common, but it is also the most expensive for private uh, landowners to participate in. So particularly for the smaller uh, family owned plots of forest, it's rare to see FSC wood because it's so expensive for them to do it. And they're all, again, they're already doing a good job of managing it. Um, it's just an extra cost for them. The SFI, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, that's another one. CSA stands for Canadian uh, Standards Asso Association. Um, there's actually a number of subcategories within here, but CSA is a good um, uh, catch-all for, for that group. And then ATF, it, ATFS is the American Tree Farm System. Again, more of the smaller uh, farmers are doing these. The thing I want to get across, though, is because we practice such good forestry in all of North America and including our federal forests, even if you don't specify a certified wood product, a certified forest product, there's a 99%, 99.9% chance that you're getting just as good and certified and environmentally friendly product as a certified uh, product. When you need to do it is obviously if a jurisdiction or a owner, an entity, uh, government entity or whatever specifies on our project, we require certified uh, wood. Okay, you have to, or you're trying to get, let's say uh, lead certification, if that's your green building system rating, uh, rating system you wanna use. You're required to do it, you have to do it. Some of the systems are very specific. They'll only give you points if you have FSC or something else. Others say it's okay to use any of them as long as it's certified. But again, don't lose any sleep over the fact that if your owner can't afford sustainable forest certification, that they're getting really anything less than in a certified for a certified product. The big thing is the documentation that follows it, which is particularly chain of custody. So literally they know where the log was harvested from, that it was harvested from a uh, a forest that uh, has all these uh, uh, controls on it. And so all of these programs have a number of similarities. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but biological diversity, they all require these different types of things. But the very last item on this list here, again, is chain of custody and label option. And this is where the big thing that having a sustainable forest through a, a certified system you have the guarantee of that chain of custody. You know where it came from. It came from a sustainable forest. What I will say though, is the whole reason for the advent of these sustainable forest systems, the certified systems is driven by what was going on in Europe where literally just like people, uh, criminals poach ivory from uh, elephants. They just shoot them, kill them, take the ivory and leave them to die. There were people poaching logs from other forests and, and whole companies doing it where they just harvest these things. They don't care anything about what they ruined in the environment. They ruined the water. They didn't replant anything. They left toxic material, whatever. That has been an ongoing issue in Europe. And that's primarily what these programs were created for. So again, in North America, we do such a good job of practicing sustainable forestry. If you aren't getting a forest certified forest product, don't lose sleep over it. Obviously, you have to do it in some cases because it's the only way you'll get your lead points or something. Um, but it's not as big a deal as some people make it out to be. It's a don't get me wrong, it's a great program, um, but it's just providing an extra level of protection on top of it um, that for the cost is surprisingly expensive for, for the additional uh, guarantee you're getting. <laughs> um, with that, then I wanna transition into the last part of my presentation, uh, talking about mass timber uh, construction. Uh, the future is looking up. And what we mean there is uh, prior to all the past IBCs and UBCs before that and all, uh, up until we get to IBC 2021, Whatever type of wood you use, whether it was light frame wood or heavy timber or this new mass timber thing, which fits in as a type of heavy timber, 
we were always limited to six stories or 85 feet. And that was actually only for business occupancy. Residential was generally five, five stories and 85 feet. The only way we could go beyond that over six stories was through this alternate materials and methods request or AMMR. You heard Chelsea use that term um, and, and do a performance based design where you're demonstrating equivalent life safety. And this is covered in the code. It's allowed under uh, section 104.11, but it is more hoops to jump through. And so up until now, that's what we had to do. And interestingly, all those heights and areas were based on a rather antiquated Heights and Areas Act from 1910. Really not, not a whole lot has changed since that time. So what happened was US building codes are about 10 to 15 years behind the mass timber movement, CLT in particular, in Europe. This was an academic uh, exercise in the early 90s in Europe. Europe started embracing it, actually building buildings out of, out of CLT and other types of mass timber. And they have some really tall buildings all over there already, 24 stories uh, in one case. So U.S. said, we've got to get up to speed. Our designers, only the only route they have is this AMMR route. That's difficult to do. And a lot of jurisdictions don't have the expertise to evaluate that. So we need to fix our codes. And so they formed this ad hoc committee from about 2016 to 2018. They did a lot of stuff, research, including testing called compartment testing, where they were actually testing different types of assemblies of mass timber. And I should mention when it says it's a balanced committee, this was not just people from the wood industry. These were people on this committee from all industries because this was gonna be ma a major change to the code and they needed to have everybody weighing in on this. So what they came up with in these, uh, in the new, uh, what we call the tall wood provisions, are some new construction types. And so historically type one and two construction has always been the non-combustible materials, no change to that. Type three and five has always been the combustible materials. This is where light frame uh, wood construction fits in. And then we've always had one type of heavy timber, which is kind of its own animal, but it was just called type four construction. We didn't have A and B categories, which were protected and non-protected, had to do with fire ratings and all. As long as you met, met minimum prescriptive sizes for heavy timber, it was deemed to have adequate fire protection. And that was based on wood's uh, predictable rate of charring in a fire. It, it protects the inner core when you have larger members. So as long as you meet those minimum dimensions, it can burn for an hour or two hour and still have enough structural core left to, to serve its structural function. Two by four studs don't do that. They're not big enough. They're too much surface area for volume, but that was the principle behind heavy timber. Now we have three new types of heavy timber and that's A, B, and C. And again, that's different levels of protection. And then they renamed the old category type four to 4-HT, basically no real big changes other than having to do with concealed spaces. But now there's a 4A, 4B, 4C, and 4-HT. Uh, and we'll talk about briefly what that is. So in the type 4A construction, um, using B occupancy as an example, in the new 2021 IBC, which 2021 IBC in most states will be adopted uh, in January of 2022. So still over a year away from that, but the B occupancy will allow 18 stories at 270 foot. Now type 4A construction requires 100% of the mass timber to be covered up, encapsulated in non-combustible membrane like gypboard. So the Brock Commons project that Chelsea did talk about how the speed of construction was so great. This is a good example of a type 4A building. It, it pretty much meets all those requirements. Every, all the mass timber is totally encapsulated. You don't see it, but speed of construction was there, lighter weight, high sustainability, all these really good features. That's how you get the maximum height building. If you wanna go with 4B, which is the second type, now it allows some of the mass timber to be exposed and it's different percentages for the ceilings and walls, but now basically on a, in the same B occupancy, we can go to 12 stories with a building height of 180 feet. Uh, the picture in the middle is actually the framework project up in Portland, which got 
went through uh, draw, design, got building part, department approval. Right when they were getting ready to break ground, they realized they had a budgeting problem because they forgot to budget for the demolition of the existing building. We don't know if this will actually get built. We hope it still does, but if and when, that'll be a good example of what a 4B building looks like. And then for 4C, um, there's a, a, actually a building up in Portland that's already built. It was done before the code came in. It's a, uh, similar to what 4C is. It's called carbon 12. Um, now, again, for business occupancy, business would limit that to nine stories and 85 feet. Uh, in the new code, it would for residential, it would be eight stories and 85 feet. But the Carbon 12 project is a perfect example of that. It's seven stories of condos over uh, one story of mixed use retail, that type of stuff down at the bottom there. So that's kind of what they look like. And you can see an interior picture there. Basically, you can uh, expose pretty much all of the mass timber, except in the shafts and concealed spaces. Uh, in, in a type 4C building. Now, the one thing I will mention, and it's important to remember, if you choose to classify your building as 4A, 4B, and 4C, basically the code says they can be non-combustible materials or mass timber. But nowhere does it allow light frame wood. And some people think, oh yeah, I can do that. I can get taller. I can do it out of mass timber but I'll still do my partitions and yeah, non-structural partitions. It's okay to do light frame wood. That is not true. Once you classify your building as 4A, 4B, and 4C, any partitions you have in there cannot be light frame wood. Even if they're totally non-structural, they will have to be something that's non-combustible, like metal stud or something like that. So in reality, all three of these types, 4A, 4B, and 4C, the only light frame wood you will have in there is your beds and your chairs and your tables and that type of thing. The structure cannot have light, cannot have light frame, light wood framing in it. Um, important to remember. So the uh, in California, and this is what I want to kind of finish the presentation about, um, California decided, believe it or not, um, and this is kind of surprising, to be early adopters. I mentioned every most other states that are on board with adopting the IBC in a timely manner. They won't adopt the 2021 IBC until January 1st of 2022. California said, no, we want to be early adopters. They voted uh, August 13th of the past summer on a proposal to uh, include the tall wood provisions as one agenda item. It passed unanimously. It's not exactly the same as the IBC. It's a little bit more conservative. I'll talk about what those changes are in just a second. But basically, then it was published on January 1st of uh, uh, 2021, and it was actually, I don't know if everybody's aware of this, but in the amendments to the 2019 CBC, which were just adopted, they are in code and official, on July 1st of 2021, we have our own set of California tallwood provisions. Um, and touching on this whole sustainability climate change issue, I wanted you to know that when you submit something like this to the Building Standards Commission for early adoption or whatever, somebody has to propose to do it. It isn't just the Building Standards Commission saying, hey, we ought to do this. Somebody needs to propose it. And sometimes it's a private sector. In this case, guess who what it was that proposed it? The California State Office of the State Fire Marshal. And so Chief Richwine, who was the, the chief at the time, um, had these comments about it. And I thought these are very cool that our, our state fire marshal would say that. It has the potential to increase the market demand for mass timber production in California. In other words, California is looking to get a CLT or mass timber manufacturer in California. We are pro mass timber in California and would like to see that happen. Um, his second item, it'll increase the pace and scale of our wildland fire prevention and forest management goals treating all these acres. And, and what he sees is it can be the small diameter trees can be used in the production of cross laminated timber and other mass timber assemblies. And so again, he sees that's the market for it. <clears throat> if we had a, a more of a demand like a CLT factory here, they'd have a, you know, they, they'd be able to use that the small lumber because again, you can make big pieces of CLT out of two by fours. Uh, and then his last comment, 
again, having to do with the sustainability part, mass timber construction helps reduce the carbon footprint compared to concrete and steel production. So <clears throat> recognized by our fire marshal, he's the one who petitioned it. They, these are what passed. So basically in a nutshell, everybody should be pretty familiar with this, but I'll summarize it quickly in case you're not. We're special in California, everybody knows that. And so what California does in their code have done in the past and continue to do, when you add sprinklers to a building, you get to take height and area increases because that increases your, uh, you know, your fire protection. And so IBC has historically said, we don't care what the occupancies are. If you use sprinklers in the building, you can take both a height and an area increase. CBC says, not so fast. We're special. If you're doing an A, E, H, I, L, or R occupancy, you cannot double dip. They will allow you to take a height increase, but if you do, you can't take the area increase. You can take the area increase, but then you can't take the height increase. You can't do both of those. And so the same thing basically has carried forward in the tall wood provisions. The second item, and it's similar to this, those same six AEH, IL, and R occupancies, when we're looking at the total area of our building, we look at the area per floor, IBC says, we don't care what the occupancy is, multiply it by three, that's your total area allowed. I, uh, CBC says, well, for some occupancies, that's fine, but if it's AEHI or R, you only get to multiply that per floor area by two. So what we really see happening in California, and this same provisions or same approach uh, happens with tall wood provisions, we see that many more of the designers will forego the 20 foot and one story increase, which is called the height increase um, and go with the area increase. Cause basically the area increase is you take the non-sprinkled area and you multiply it by three for a multi-story building. Um, that's, that's for the area. Uh, and, and so then when you start looking at, you know, the area per floor and the area per building, you definitely want to get that bigger area. But if you took that height increase, you're stuck with that base area per floor. And if it was an AEH ILNR occupancy, you only get to multiply it by two. So the total volume of these tall wood buildings, if you went for the height increase, which is the 20 foot and one story, would be significantly less than a building where you took the area increase and didn't go for that extra story. So using an example for a construction where we said we can go 18 stories, 270 feet, as long as you're willing to live with 17 stories and 250 feet, then you get the full area increase. And so particularly in those taller buildings, that's what we really see happening where they, <coughs> where they will potentially use the uh, taller increases See, if you have a really tight site where you're not, you, you can't even get close to the area, you won't need a firewall anyway. So then go ahead and take the full, full height increase. You don't need the area increase in that case. So uh, I want to wrap up then by just quickly mentioning that we do have a number of great uh, resources available on our website. And one of the newest ones we're most proud of is a brand new mass timber design manual that we co-authored with Thinkwood. Um, you can get a link to it on our website as well as Thinkwood, uh, Thinkwood's website. It's over 80 pages. Uh, it's not printed. It's a uh, online live document that is constantly updated. Um, but if you're thinking of doing mass timber, this has just every resource possible. Really, really great, uh, great thing for, for, your, uh, uh, for your knowledge base. Uh, we also have a uh, index of mass timber connections. We worked with Swinerton Mass Timber and KLNA. They were the engineers on the Plat 15 building that uh, Chelsea mentioned, one of the first mass timber buildings in, in Denver there. And so now we have an index that lists all the different types of connection, panel to panel, panel to, uh, to column, uh, you know, to beam, all that type of stuff uh, in our index there. And, and you can go through and, and look at that. That's available on our website to, to download. Um, and then also, we have a great uh, a, a paper on mass timber insurance. This, because it's a new product, some people in the insurance industry are a little wary of it. Um, we have a great paper that addresses a lot of those concerns, and particularly if 
you have owners and developers that are having issues with this, uh, you direct them to this and it's a great resource. Uh, another thing we're doing, we have a construction management program and we're actually, uh, we've been, we've teamed up with the, originally it was the Chicago Carpenters Union to actually provide installer training for CLT. Um, those, that picture you see that all that CLT is actually owned by Woodworks. We let the Carpenters Union use it to take it apart and put it together a million times so they can train their forces to do CLT. That has expanded and I can proudly say and I'm not sure what the situation is with Chelsea, but I know in Southern California, um, we've reached an agreement with the Southwest Regional Carpenters Council. I think that's the big union uh, for the union and signatories. Install, CLT installer training is coming to Southern California. It will be in Buena Park in uh, Q1 of 2022. So there will be a source for installer training for all the contractors that are looking to do this. Um, and then we also have a couple of uh, business case studies of real projects that we got input from developers on lesson learned. They talked about a lot of the performance data. Again, if you need to convince a developer client why they should use mass timber, a lot of good information here. Uh, so with that, uh, I think we're oh, went a little over our time, but sorry about that. Anyway, uh, we're going to finish up now and open it up for questions. So uh, if uh, We'd like to get to okay. the question part here. Thank you, Mike Chelsea, and Chelsea. So uh, this is Bill Burke again. I'm going to try and run through the questions that we've got. So uh, one question there's several people uh, would like to answer is, could you talk a little bit about sourcing? How many mass timber fabricators own their own forest for use in their projects? versus sourcing material on the open market? And then, you know, does this relate to forest certification for wood products at all? Uh, you know what, I'll take the first part of that. Chelsea, do you want to talk about the certification thing? Or I can take it all, but you okay? Yeah, I'll, I'll you go for it and I'll add in. If I okay, have okay. So uh, in terms of uh, mass timber actual manufacturers, and I, again, we use the term CLT almost interchangeably. There is one, Mass timber manufacturer called where they manufacture dowel laminated timber. That's up in Canada. But there are about 10 or so CLT manufacturers spread out through the US and Canada. I think it's like seven in the US and three in Canada. We don't have any in California yet, uh, but there are all of the ones, if they're going to use the product in the US, it has to be PRG320 certified. All of the US manufacturers are. There is a number of other manufacturers over in Europe and three of them also have PRG 320 certification. They are shipping to the United States and they're apparently competitively cost because projects are being built in the United States with the European mass timber. Um, and so I, if you need a list of those, we, I can provide you with the list that has the contact info or, or any of those manufacturers. Um, just, just contact myself or Chelsea. And again, we touched on this briefly. Chelsea has Northern California. I have Southern California. Doesn't matter where your project is. It's where your office is located. That's how you determine who your regional director is. So Chelsea, why don't you answer the part about the certified? Uh, yeah, so I, I think the question was also about if they own their own forests or if they source material on open market. And I do, I know of at least three that do have their own forest land. Um, a lot of the manufacturers, you know, started as lumber mills and they've taken on more and more of these engineered wood products. Um, and so if you're interested in that specifically, you know, we can point you in that direction. Um, and they all can uh, source FSC if that's something that's important or SFI. Um, it's really just lead time and premium, as Mike said. So there's a lot of different options out there for that. Great, thank you. Um, acoustics, what's the performance of uh, mass timber um, and how does it acoustically and how does it compare, for example, to a concrete structural system? Yeah, so I was gonna sh maybe show, so we have um, a inventory of tested assemblies, floor tested assemblies. So the lightweightness of CLT mass timber helps us in terms of seismic, in terms of constructing the building. It doesn't help us in terms of acoustics. So we're always gonna be adding uh, some sort of acoustic mat, uh, floor finish, 
to increase our acoustics, make it better on um, a floor assembly. So we have a list of those floor assemblies we can send you. It's available on our website. Um, and it's really just the mass, you know, the mass isn't as much um, as concrete. So yeah. we're going to have to reach it in other ways. The, yeah. the, and, yeah. and I will mention predominantly when you're exposing it, everybody wants to expose the bottom side so you can see it. You do need to understand, and I do have one project going on where they did this. Uh, the CLT, even though it's a very strong product, it's made from a softwood lumber. You'll want to cover the top, not only to protect it, but that's where you get your acoustic performance out of putting the material on the top. If you just have a bare CLT panel, it will not, it will not meet an STC of, of 50 or an IIC or anything. But I want to add, just because it's strong, if you don't put some type of covering over it, it will not wear very well. The chair, you know, the wheels, it will cut grooves in it. Yes, it's a strong material, but it's a soft wood material. I try to discourage that. There is one project that they are doing it because they just love the look of it uh, and they're willing to accept that. So I hope that answers. Okay. Uh, another person mentioned that the Ready Mix Concrete Association says a considerable amount of greenhouse gas emissions come from wood decomposing in landfills. So do you want to just speak briefly to that? And then also um, sort of related to that, what can architects do to um, reduce this issue of decomposition at end of life of a wood product? Yeah, Mike, can I share my screen briefly if you stop? Oh, yeah. Sorry, yep. Okay. I just wanna show this again, um, the carbon cycle. So I mentioned that, you know, wood forest, they sequester the carbon, so the carbon from the atmosphere goes into the product. But yes, when they are burned, when they are uh, disposed of, they will decompose and re release that carbon dioxide back into the environment. But this is a closed loop. Yes, it will release it back into the environment, but it's the CO2 that it took out of the environment. So it's not adding additional, it was stuff that it already sequestered. So things you can do to reduce that is to, you know, I think mass timber is great because they're large panels. They're big beams and beam, big columns. We're already hearing project teams thinking about how can this building be re reused at the end of its life because these products are going to be great for reuse. So that's how we store and sequester that carbon for longer. Yeah, know. that's the key. Just trying to try to uh, uh, prevent it from making it to the landfills, not creating any more CO2 than was ever there, but you can help eliminate more by not sending it to the landfill. So reusing it. Okay. Um, another person asked about uh, replacing floor joists with CLT panels and asks, how thick is the floor sandwich? And then is there space for electrical mechanical plumbing in that floor thickness? So for me, sort of related to that, um, in, in, to what extent is there a below the CLT panel structure supporting a CLT panel, or is the CLT panel itself structural and sort of flooring? Uh, you want me to start with that one, Chelsea? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, I'll say first and foremost, if you're looking to put in a CLT panel to replace a light frame floor system because you think it's going to save money in material, you're barking up the wrong tree. I've done calculations and other people have too. If you look at the total amount of wood fiber in a CLT assembly versus a light frame assembly, whether it's a wall or a floor, it's on the neighborhood or the order of five to eight times as much wood fiber. Somebody pays for that fiber. So it is not a direct material cost replacement to save money. There are other reasons for doing it like lower overall building height, beauty of the wood, that type of thing but it's not gonna be an economical, uh, it's not gonna save money from the material cost standpoint. Now, how deep is it? The good general rule of thumb for a floor assembly anyway, and I'll mention floors are governed by, by, by vibration, generally not strength, unless it's really heavy loading. The rule of thumb is whatever your span is in feet, call that inches, so let's say 20 feet, let's say 20 inches then, divide by two. For a 20 foot span on a vibration, uh, vibration controlled floor, you'll need a panel roughly 10 inches thick. If you looked at eye joists or whatever for 20 foot span, 
It's gonna be something a little thicker than that. Um, so it is slightly thinner. It's saving a little bit there, but that's a good um, rule of thumb. Um, and then, so Chelsea, do you wanna take the second half of that question? Um, we we are out of time. I don't know if we need to, you know, let folks go. Um, uh, well, yeah, we do have a couple more questions, but you, but Chelsea, you're right. It's one thirty, so um, I'll pass the questions on along to uh, Chelsea and Mike, and you know, if we're able to get answers um, uh, easily and get them out to the uh, people who are on the program today, we'll do that. Um, okay. So I also just want to say, you know, please feel free to email Mike and I, if you have follow-up questions that we didn't get to, like, we're happy to answer your questions. So I'm sorry, we ran out of time to answer all of them, but please, like, and, and if you don't get an answer. Of, yeah, We have a bunch of geniuses in our help desk. So when you stump us, we just go to our geniuses at the help desk and we can definitely get your answer. Yeah. And I'll just mention before we close, you know, uh, so first I want to thank Chelsea and Mike very, very much for presenting. I want to thank everybody um, who's, who was on the program today and just remind you that we'll report your AI credits. And, um, and then as Chelsea just mentioned, um, you know, you can contact her and Mike directly with um, follow-up questions. So um, thanks everybody. And, and thank, thanks again to Mike and Chelsea and to Amanda AIA California. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you.